and all kinds of things are going, and there's no one more suited to talk about where it all is than Mario Batali. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Me. That was an unusually adept curtsy. I might consider myself in the top 10% curtsiers. Really? Yeah. It's a lost art, I think, yeah. curtsying. Um, Anyway, let's just get into it. Um, I want to really have a conversation because you've been, you're sort of, you've made this leap um, in a lot of ways that a lot of people haven't um, towards where things are going um, in digital. So I want to get, I want to start right off talking about how do you, um, you're a celebrity chef, which we're all, we're all used to celebrity chefs and things like that, but talk about what it's like to be that in this age and what, what does that entail, you know, for pushing around the things you want to push? Well, I'm not, I'm not really sure there are that many celebrity chefs. A lot okay. of people go with that moniker because okay. they were once on TV. I mean, right. I would consider celebrity chef to be Wolfgang Puck, mm -hmm. um, Emeril Lagasse maybe, and then maybe there's a couple of latecomers. But just because you've been on TV doesn't make you a celebrity chef. But what it entails right. is hopefully doing something that you're good at right. and garnering a little bit of media because you're capable of either teaching people how to do it or how to appreciate it or how to get it. Mm -hmm. And that the, the success that you have at that gives you celebrity right. because people can follow you and they can understand it and the, and the methodology of your kind of strategy or your ideology is easily understandable or translatable into the way that a lot of people wanna see it. It's very much like pop songs. If you hear, um, uh, the first time you hear a great U2 song, you know that you've already heard it before because they've mined into something that was already in your primordial brain. And it's the same thing with cooking or exchanging any information. If you can speak in those terms, people can recognize it even if it's new to them for that minute. Right, so how do you use, you're very active on social medias on all of them. Talk about each of them, how you use them and how you think about them. Well, Twitter's where I find the best time to pick a fight when I'm bored. Okay, which is... Um, a lot, I've noticed. Yeah, well, like, Twitter gives me an opportunity to meet a lot of people, many of whom don't agree with me, but follow me anyway. Mm -hmm. So they'll say something preposterous, and I have learned not to tolerate preposterousness. Okay. And I'll say something that I find can help us discuss that. Mm -hmm. And then they'll be angry or not angry or whatever, and I try to find a way that it makes it seem like we could possibly go along in our lives together even though we disagree. And I that's see. kind of what Twitter is. For you? For me. Is it a marketing vehicle? Do you see it as that? Well, I think it's just more of an, a very nice platform for me to be able to discuss my ideology, my thoughts, my reality, um, the way I look at food, the way I look at politics, and that we don't always have to agree with everything, but we can all agree that maybe we're all working toward a better world or a better place, and that's kind of where I live on Twitter. Right, is there a downside to that? Because you're really out there compared to, a lot of people are super careful, well, not, not everyone of, is anymore. But right, I, I think the downside, it's not for me. I, I, I'm not worried about the downside. People are often threat that, well, if you say something about uh, Trump's policy, the people that support Trump aren't going to come to your restaurants. I'm like, who the fuck cares? Mm -hmm. Like, if they're, they're going to come to my restaurants and when they're hungry, right, not, right, because, right. They, not because I agree with their policy. Right, right, right. And, and, if, they, and if they're that kind of person, then, then we got to get rid of them anyway. Like, right, right. the people that live on that kind of a black and white line in the political world, and that's how they've lived their entire world, we need to move them somewhere else. Right. They have to go. Okay, all right, okay. Not at your restaurants. So. They can go to my restaurant. That's my point. Like, I don't, to I, I tolerate any level of asshole in my restaurant. Mm -hmm. And, but I also tolerate really nice people, but we don't mind. Like, right, right. you can be radically different from us. We just want to make you happier by giving you something delicious to eat and a relaxing, comfortable chair and serve you properly. Okay, we're going to get into what a restaurant's going to be in the okay. future. Instagram. Instagram's more me showing you how I think happiness could be recognized. Like, okay. I'm just happy on Instagram. I don't show anybody doing something wrong. I generally show things that I'm doing that moment. I rarely take a picture of me. Mm -hmm. It's more like what I'm looking at, not look at me, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, but it is what I'm doing, and it's, you know, what I think is pretty or beautiful or interesting or, or dark or frightening or thoughtful or exotic. And, you know, it's whatever I see that strikes me. And if it's a... A beautiful image, that makes it even better, but sometimes it's very repetitive. For me, getting up in the morning and taking a picture of my same beach in Michigan makes me excited. And it's mm -hmm. just, I share that with people. And I have a couple of buzz hashtags like, we, mm -hmm. that people can hear. Or they either yeah. get it or they're like, you fucking asshole, you keep saying we. <laughs> and it's like, because I'm actually that happy. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, you can use emojis. And by the way, they move around now. 
that I've, I've heard. I yes. saw the new phone yesterday. I'm yes. pretty excited. They're going to dance with me. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so, uh, YouTube. YouTube, I, I think, I don't really go to YouTube per se, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty sure my team puts things on YouTube. Right. But I think YouTube also finds its own stuff. Right. Like YouTube, like whatever goes on the chew that finds its way into YouTube or that started somewhere. We did a show called Feedback Kitchen or I did right. something called Two Minutes on the High Road. Like all of that ends up living on YouTube for free. And there was a moment when everyone said, listen, you have to capitalize on that. You have to own it and you have to somehow create a monetary wall. And I'm just like, well, why? Mm -hmm. I'm already in business in a lot of different ways. Right. Why wouldn't I want to give that access free that would drive the consumer to understand my core business? not my peripheral business, which is kind of the promotion of my Is that the same business. thing on Facebook and Snapchat? Right, is exactly. That how you, that you, you well, use Snapchat, I just think I'm, I'm aged out. Okay, all right. I don't understand it. I believe Snapchat started as a way for my children to show their friends their genitals very quickly. Okay, all right. And, 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 and I think that older people are trying to get a hold of that right now, right, right, but right. it doesn't seem that I don't want to be yeah, in that room. That was the, biz that was the original business plan, right. I think. Um, so let's get into the idea of what a restaurant is then, because one of the things we were talking about earlier with Laura and, and Kristen was talking about is the, 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 the blurring of retail and brand and how you do things. What do you, um, you've been very early to a lot of technologies around restaurants. Let's first talk about the technology at restaurant. Do you, not just open table and you, reservation systems, but the entire process. How do you look at where it's going right now? Well, for me, technology in terms of managing my inventory, sharpening up my purchasing, and understanding my customers' behavior is excellent. That's mm -hmm. open table. That's also something that we use called Avero that gives me kind of a P&L statement every night at 2 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. of all of the restaurant's activity, what was sold, what was purchased, what was uh, complained about, what was comped. Uh, any kind of retaliation or any kind of uh, res resolution of any kind of um, mm -hmm. odd problem that happened. And general, just a PL and an understanding of that. Um, in the world of purchasing, that helps us because it more or less sets up our lines. In terms of promotion, technology is whatever it's going to be. It's all of the social medias. Other than that, we're kind of very straightforward. I still use fire to cook my food. I understand the new technologies of the immersion circulators and the low temperature cooking and all of those things, but they don't interest me that much because I like crust on my meat, not poaching it and then reverse searing it and all of those other things. So mm -hmm. the technology of the equipment hasn't really changed my world. Not, not at all. No, not, no, a little. Like I don't stop my guys and gals from doing it, but it's not really where we live in terms of So do of you food. imagine restaurants are the things that's hard to digitize, although I've seen it. I've, I've, you started to see it in San Francisco. There's a couple uh, restaurants like Itza. Have mm -hmm. you seen them? Yeah. What do you think of them? Itza I, is a, for those who don't know, is a restaurant that there's fast, no people. Fast pizza. Yes. <laughs> no, Itza. Oh, Itza. Itza. Oh, no, you know, this is a restaurant where there's, a, there's just screens and you order everything on your app and it's all, you know, it's all quinoa, quick, kale, and then you personalize it. And then it, there's no people, and it, the screens open up almost like an automat. It's, it this is, explains why I don't know a bunch about yes, that. Yes, exactly. So, but it's no people whatsoever. Right. The food is delicious. It's very fresh. It's, it's healthy. It's, it's, it, it tends in the Gale Quinoa right. school of food. I understand why it exists. Right. right. So, because as, the, as we raise all of the costs of the staffing, mm -hmm. as, I mean, minimum wage is a great idea. Mm -hmm. Raising it to a high number is a very fascinating way to look at enriching the basic populace. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you raise one of these physical costs to a smaller operator, you must realize that that's going to affect the bottom line, meaning the prices are going to have to go up. And, and you know, everyone champions all of these great things and all of these fantastic social movements, mm -hmm. but they're preying on a business that already has thin margins. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, petroleum isn't being taxed that hard. Mm -hmm. So it's an odd thing that minimum wage, as effective as it might be to augmenting the general lifestyle of a lot of people, it's not the fastest way to get people a higher quality of life. But I'm talking about no employees. Like rest, the well, restaurant there's somebody experience. making that yeah, food. Well, maybe. It could be a robot back. I'm, they're not letting me back there okay. yet. I've Trust me that there's a human being back there. At this point. Yes. But it's really interesting. There's a lot of investments going into the idea of of changing the whole way restaurants are done. I was in an airport the other day, everything's on an iPad, they right. bring it to you. What, do, do you think like that or do you feel that there's not gonna be a shift in how restaurants are? Will restaurants just be restaurants for ever? I mean, I, am, I, I used to, I mean, remember, when we opened Babo, there was no internet and there was no cell phones and mm -hmm. I was perplexed that they could ever be any help to us. Mm -hmm. So anything could change and I'm not opposed to the idea of that. 
-hmm. But what our restaurants espouse is the human touch. For me, the ultimate luxury is not the lack of humans. Mm -hmm. It's that there are humans there right. and that they're touching it with their personal potential for error. And mm -hmm. their humanness is what makes something for me really delicious. And mm -hmm. that interchange is super significant to my style of restaurant. That doesn't mean that that's not going to be somewhere else. And I mean, in a world where Chipotle can go further and further and further, you don't necessarily need a human relationship with a delicious, well-sourced, great idea to bring bring you that food in a very quick time. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the kind of restaurant experience that I have spent a lot of my time developing and working on, I don't see me getting rid of human beings too quickly. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, when you think about the restaurant experience, what it hasn't changed in forever. In, in, in forever. Since it's you know water for my men and whiskey for my horses. It's right. been all that ever since. Right. And do you imagine, when you think about innovation then in the space, how do you think about it? Because people think of you as very innovative. What do you imagine? Like you're, talk about Italy, for example. Explain what it is and then. Italy is a, a giant retail, uh, not giant, medium sized, 50,000 square feet grocery store with five or six or seven restaurant concepts inside of it. But fundamentally, the ideology behind Italy is we want you to learn how to cook at home and, take, and cook at home. So it's a grocery store with a bunch of tasting rooms that allow you to understand the potential for the ingredients around you. You learn it, you eat it, you taste it there. We give you the recipe, we help you shop for it, you take it home and you go do it yourself. At that point, you can also personalize it and make it your own as opposed to merely the recipe, which is the ultimate success of a good home cook is understanding that, yes, I saw the recipe and then I saw these other ingredients and I put them all together in this amazing way and I put it together and not only did it make me happy, it made you happy and we're all happy. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to, is, to, is to combine the two where you don't separate them out. Right. And the idea is also to empower people to take charge more of the health and, and, and uh, so, nutritional decisions. So how do you making. look at a lot of the delivery service? We had the Blue Apron CEO here before. I think it's fantastic. They're Because what what, what, basically the enemy is the fast food robot run restaurant in mm -hmm. this space. Mm -hmm. And what we want you to do is understand that when you're doing that, you're probably compromising some of the decision making that you're going to make about nutrition, vitamins, texture, the wholeness or the integrity of the product that it's buying because they've been shipped to get there in the right way and they've probably been manipulated by some machinery. And, and then that machinery doesn't necessarily make it bad, but it's the processing of our food that is robbing it of essential components of it that's really important. For us, taking things from raw and cooking it in the right amount of time in the right amount of way gives you the maximum expression of what the food could be both nutritionally and in flavor and in expression of your own human mm -hmm. core. So what do you think of those businesses? Those, the idea that both, say, the munchries of the world and then the plated, the blue aprons, uh, you don't have one, right? You don't, have you thought you know, about We've talked to a bunch of people about them. I haven't yet found one where I'm entirely successfully behind it. I think if it's just buying commercial goods and putting it in a box, that's one thing. I think where Blue Apron made a really smart move is they started buying and, and going on a, on a vertical sense. They own a specific ranch of turkeys. Mm -hmm. And when you know that when you go with them, you get the best possible turkey, then there's another reason for me to go. But if it's just them going shopping for me and putting it in a box of commercial goods, then I'm not that interested in it. Mm -hmm. So for me, their, their next phase is to create and identify the best producers and get exclusives on those products so that when you buy them, you get Chino Ranch carrots and you get this kind of turkey and this kind of seafood and mm -hmm. responsibly sourced, well-grown stuff th whose companies also speak for a larger ideology. Would you create one? I'm or? thinking about it. I'm trying to figure it out. What would it be? It would probably be with Italy and it would be, you know, using artisanal products based there and here, you know, mm -hmm. like maybe some olive oil and some kind of pasta made from my favorite places and then products based here, basically seasonal, mm -hmm. regional, you know, all the buzzwords that we all hear about, but done in a way that you could produce it and make it less expensive than going out. That's, I think, yeah. the best value. Yeah. Do you see an economic challenge to these kind of businesses? I think the economic challenge is to make sure that you, just like in a real restaurant, when you buy stuff, I mean, our, our basic method in all of my restaurants and everyone understands this, is we buy stuff, we fix it up, and we sell it for profit. If there's any breakdown in any three of those steps, your businesses start to fall apart. If you buy stuff and you don't sell it, you have a problem. If you fix it up and you don't sell it, or if you buy stuff and throw it away, you, it, it falls apart. Where those businesses can go wrong is that they buy the wrong amount of food, and they end up not using it and not selling it. Or they sell it in a challenged way where it's beyond its, you know, excellent date. Right. What about the food preparation? Not that it's not to the plate where they send you ingredients, but they like the munchies where it's not takeout because you, you all use 
Uber, all the delivery services, uh -huh. correct, for your restaurants. And it's, is it an important part? Is it becoming an increasingly important part? It will probably become a little bit, but we don't really quantify so much about the delivery and takeout stuff, mm -hmm. unless it's in a pizzeria, because a lot of the food that we create in most of our restaurants needs to be eaten relatively quickly and doesn't really have a stable shelf life, right. even for a half hour in a hot car. Right. So what do you think about those, all those? There's, a ton, I think there's like 90. I call San Francisco assisted living for millennials. Right. Um, because like they can have anything. And just the other day, there was a bento box company where it's in a trunk and they make bento boxes in the trunk, right. hot and cold. There's, there's, there's one called this. There's a million of them. Right. There's a million of them. I, I embrace their ideas and I look forward to seeing one that actually meets my standards. I have not found one yet. Because? I don't think the food's very good by the time it gets to my house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, something that's all cold, maybe there's an opportunity. Like if you had a sushi chef driving around in a car and just slicing stuff up right then and there, just like at their sushi restaurant, then right. that makes a lot of sense. So a sushi car. Sushi car, sushi truck, you sushi probably, mobile. Yeah, yeah, you could probably get 20 million for that right yeah. now from some venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. Let's talk about the investments in food because there's a ton of them lately and some of them haven't worked. A Juicero, for example. Yes. Um, uh, Soylent, which I still don't understand. Uh, exactly, um, and then which is I think what it is is it's a it's a conceptual idea that people in Silicon Valley are too busy to eat. I think that's really what is around those kind of things. That means they're going to die. Yes, probably. Um, no, they're not. They're also working on anti-death things. Yeah, but I mean, anti-death things, as long as you have no fuel, you will die eventually. Yes, exactly. But they think Soylent is fine. It takes it. Right, and if they're going to be all right, then, and then they're going to be a vast division of culture. That's true. Um, but they, there's all kinds of investments in food technology, and the technology of food itself, not things to make food. Um, we've put Impossible Foods, for example, uh, on stage. This is the the bloody plant burger. Yeah, um, I think it's delicious. What, what do you? Uh, it is delicious. It's actually quite good, and, and they're they're aiming at people who like meat, not vegetarians. Right, right exactly. A, so, which is the problem with all vegetarian restaurants is that mm -hmm. they pretend that they're only a vegetarian restaurant. If you go to all good Italian restaurants, you can eat as a vegetarian and have a delicious meal. It's when they start excluding all these things that all of a sudden the food isn't necessarily that good because they get so caught up in the dogma that they forget to make something delicious and simple. Ah, what do you really think? Um, so what? So. When you think about the idea around food technology, create, making it, um, most people think the way food is delivered and made and created is problematic in this country. You mean like served in portions of edible, chewable stuff? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I'm not they, down with changing that too much. Well, they are. They're tr starting to really invest in the idea of, of mo molecular change of food. How, right. do you, how do you look at those? I would say if, an example would be GMOs, which is a very fundamental, not very much big of a, big of a change. Mm -hmm. The reason that they I, ideally tried to pitch GMOs is to increase our, our yields. Mm -hmm. But in America, we already throw away 41% of our food. We grow enough food in America to feed North, Central, and South America every day, all day, for the rest of our lives, as it stands right now. So I don't think crop yields is a problem in America. So there's no reason for us to use GMOs yet. In fact, GMOs haven't really been tested the way they would test like a cancer drug, and yet they're, they're, they're going to feed them to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I'm not anti-GMO. I'm just anti-throwing things into people's bodies that isn't being tested. I can say that in Italy, you can't even fly over Italy with a GMO seed. It's against the law. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to go with them for a little while until mm -hmm. we figure it out. I'm saying the jury's still out on a lot of the science. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to any of it. I think it's mm -hmm. all fantastic, and we should certainly embrace ideologically the idea that things are going to change. Right. Does but like, let's not lose the idea that it's still fun to have a hot dog. Mm -hmm. I, I get that, but I'm talking about the making of food, like right. how food is made in our country, how it's distributed. Right. Um, do you imagine there being any big change? Because I mean, there's been pushes towards nutritional things and how we bring fresh foods and whole foods and everything like that. There's well, I was at a place called Arrow Farms okay. um, last weekend for a shoot that we did for the Chew, and they are creating with virtually no soil. Uh, no sunlight and a little bit of water, uh, vegetables that they can grow in a room like this, they could grow an incredible amount of vegetables with no byproducts and no waste of the soil and no waste of other natural resources, freeing them up for another use. Whatever that natural use might be, I can't imagine mm -hmm. what you might use these resources for other than making the food that we eat, but in any case, it frees them up. The idea that that exists and the idea that science can create that Mm -hmm. is, is a great movement forward for me. Mm -hmm. The idea of compressing 5,000 calories into a tube this big that has no flavor at all just so that I could live longer while I'm not doing anything mm -hmm. doesn't seem to me a very good waste of our time. It is a waste. I, I mean, a very good waste yeah, of yeah. our time. So, so, so when, when you are thinking about where food is going, what do you imagine the innovations are in food? 
Well, I think the innovations will be more on how you can properly store food that has been grown well. Mm -hmm. I think the slow food movement is an interesting thing in that it is not necessarily all about old school thinking, but it's about how to manage an uh, increasingly crowded, smaller planet using a limited amount of resources to create still nutritional, delicious, wholesome food that has a story to it that gives us both emotional and physical well-being. Mm -hmm. What do you think about what David's doing at, uh, uh, David um, Chang doing at Mamafuku, the, the different things there, a lot of the chefs are doing, trying to change the way uh, e every strata of society eats? Chang's one of the really smart guys, so I'm always trying to figure out what the hell he's talking about. Okay. And I'm also fascinated by the way that he approaches all of the pantry ingredients of Southeast Asia and, 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 and in his world by using them from different ways and fermenting different things as opposed to the traditional soy-based culture. And do you imagine doing things like, do you, do you think about doing apps and getting pe changing the way that is served to people? We're working on about 1,500 things, but I must say I have a very high threshold for changing anything. I don't change things just to change things or to get into the media. I change things because they will have long-lasting positive effect, both financially and on changing the way that my people work. All right, we're going to last talk, we're going to talk about sort of your shows and television and how you look at, uh, you've been working with, you've been shifting all around. Like you talked a little bit about doing YouTube and things like that, but you now have The Chew. Yes. And you're doing stuff with who? Who else? Uh, Vice. Yeah. I do a show called Moltissimo, which is kind of the old style cooking show where I talk to the people in front of me, tell them a little historical perspective on what we eat. But as opposed to me playing like a jazz musician who never breathes, I actually talk to them and I hear what they say. So there's mm -hmm. a little bit more of an interview component to it. I just finished shooting the pilot with a company called ZPZ 0.0, .0 for uh, Netflix. We're shooting a show called In the Pinks with Mario Batali. I sit on uh, a pink Adirondack chair and someone sits right next to me and we look out and we shot the pilot with Maria Bello this summer, in which case we were looking out over Lake Michigan, but they could be in Piazza Navona, they could be in the Andes. But you take and pink chairs around? I would take two Adirondack chairs. It's an incredibly low-budget production. Okay. But the idea would be that we're talking about where we are and we're also interviewing someone who may or may not have that much to do with where we are. And then 40% of it is animated. So maybe when I talk about the 673 shipwrecks in Lake Michigan, we actually dive into the water, animated as characters, and go find out how and the where and the why these ships were wrecked in the first place. Really? Yeah. That's unusual. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. And that has nothing to do with cooking. Well, absolutely. Except I'm a cook. Not? Absolutely. Exactly. No, yeah. absolutely. It has nothing yeah. to do with cooking. Yeah, yeah. So what are you going for there? Just experience? I'm, I am uh, constantly fascinated by the interaction with other humans, and I think that there is, it's time for me, I enjoy a deeper dive into just the general conversation and thought process between mm -hmm. like-minded individuals or anti-like-minded, people right. that aren't like-minded. How do you like working with the Netflix? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm about to interview Shonda Rhimes, uh, which her new Netflix deal, uh, you're all moving toward, what is that like? Because you, you had traditional shows, you've had documentaries, you've done various things, and The Chew is a, is a network show. Major network, ABC yeah. Disney. Yeah. Um, I, I think that as the, as, as the viewership changes to wherever it wants to go, mm -hmm. that's where people are going. They're trying to figure out where you're going to find more eyeballs to watch what you work on, because when mm -hmm. you work on it and no one looks at it, it's not very satisfying. And meaning that it doesn't matter where you put things. Right, I don't, I don't have a, a, a philosophical bent on where I'm going to be. I would right. just rather reach more people. All right, last uh, bunch of questions. I, I do want to get back to the idea of the future of food um, and what you think the biggest trends are. Because, you know, people don't think of food as in innovative, you know, or the changes around it. Right. And again, like, Silicon Valley get, goes at it sometimes. Did you have a Juicero? I'm just curious. Did I have a? a Juicero. No, I did not. No, you did not. No. Um, but they're trying I have different... a blender. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> That's what it turns out. Right. That's all you needed. It's all you really yeah, needed you didn't in the need first a $700 place. $700 juicing machine. Right. Um, I am talking to a couple people who have a very interesting idea about taking a pod and creating a, a smoothie variant that is completely nutrition and diet based on whatever you want, where you can make it into that with natural water in any case and have it hot or cold, whether it's a soup or a smoothie, in about one minute and you can carry it with you. And the pod is very much like those Nespresso pods and yeah. it's completely nutritionally balanced and there's something to that what idea. What do you do with the pod? You mean, well, you extract okay. what's in it and make it into whatever you're going to eat by mixing it with water. 
Okay, that sounds very Star Trek. That's yeah, like, very, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like the idea because I think that people are looking, if those people are looking for a quick way to get the right amount of nutrition and they don't think that food is probably the best way, this might be the answer for them. Right, right. And we're thinking about doing what with it? What, what's Selling it to people. Selling it to people. Like Mario Batali's food pods? Yes. Something along those lines. Okay. Don't use the word pod. It just doesn't No, matter. I don't think pod's going to be it. I think it'll be like... Maybe capsule? What do you think of capsule? No, that sounds even worse. It sounds even worse. How about plastic condom filled with jizzy stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I can see the marketing right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't, that's interesting. Yeah. It, it feels like Silicon Valley these yeah. days. Yeah, it would work really well with all the sexual harassment. I don't think that'll work. Yeah, I don't no, think so either. I was just throwing it out there. You okay, know. well. I got my know, market research right here. We're going to hear about it on Twitter in about yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, there's no bad ideas, they yeah, say. I think, so. I think there are, but in fact, there's Well, you have to find out about it, though. It's bad. It would be it's bad true. to think a bad idea is bad before you even really explore yeah, it for a minute. Yeah, yeah, So do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? You are, obviously. Definitely. How, what do you think is important in being an entrepreneur? Like, well, I you're think... You're a food entrepreneur. Food entrepreneur. Right. Um, I think what's important in the world of entrepreneurship is to feel that you can do anything, that you shouldn't think that there are any boundaries but that you do have a responsibility to the people that you're working with mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't risk so much that they no longer have a job. Mm -hmm. So I have at this point 4,000 employees and I How take- How many restaurants? So I have 26 restaurants and I'm involved in six grocery stores right now. Okay. You're a partner in Italy. Partner right? in Italy, yeah. Right, right. And so, but the entrepreneurial spirit, do you feel like, I feel like food's always been sort of entrepreneurial. Oh, absolutely, because, you know, basically half the restaurants that opened in the first two years close mm -hmm. because they were poorly planned and because a lot of people open a restaurant because they can do a really good dinner party, but they don't understand what it really takes to operate a restaurant on a consistent basis. And last question I asked this of, uh, of Laura, what is the most interesting thing you've seen in food lately that's not yours? Like you go, you, you go all over the place, you see all kinds of things, you see, you know, what's happening. What do you, what do you, what do you find that's really inspires you recently? I, I, got, I, I have to say, in all honesty, I'm never that impressed by brand new, complete innovation. What has fascinated me the most this year was an ancient recipe using a cheese that still has live maggots crawling around in it from Sicily. And ah. it's the way that they created it into this weird little salad that's been served, actually in Sardinia, it's been served for you know, 2,000 years. For me, that is far more interesting than something that some kid came up with last week. That may eventually be something that interesting, but mm -hmm. just novelty and newness for me isn't nearly as exciting as something that has withstood the test of time. So maggots. Maggots and cheese. Maggots and cheese is On your... a salad. <laughs> Served to you by people with really old, wrinkly hands. <laughs> um, one question I did forget to ask you about is when you think about where we are right now in this country, um, since you are, uh, you are so active on social media, where, are you positive, negative, are you, you know, you're always so ebullient and really positive, but also have, have a lot of opinions. Well, we're in a tricky spot. We have a very unusual level of oddball leadership right now. I, I don't think that it will crush us, and I don't think we are looking at the Armageddon, but that which does not destroy us makes us stronger, and we are there where we need to be stronger. It's a weird time. Yeah, it's definitely. But maggots and cheese, so here Hell, we are. you just eat All maggots right. and cheese, you'll forget about the questions rest of the maggots. Questions from the audience, and I do want questions. Questions? Please, don't be shy. This is the shyest audience we've had. Anybody? You have Mario Batali here? None? Zero? All right, I'll keep asking a few more questions. Um, when you think about um, where the big restaurant chains, like McDonald's and others, I just, I, I, they are seeing lots of trouble. Now, they were the original, I just saw fa the founder, I don't know if you saw the movie, yeah. um, original Across. innovators, yeah. the innov innovators around food and fast food. How do you look at that market? Well, it's the most influential market there is. There's more people that eat in those restaurants than eat in any other yeah. restaurants in the world. So I would say they could be the key to helping us understand our food um, waste situation. Mm -hmm. If we can monetize a way of saving food that we would throw away, if we could get one of those big four fast food hamburger joint chains to create a vegetable patty, a veggie paste patty, mm -hmm. that you would sell for the same 99 cents that you sell your regular beef patty for, and you could get... LeBron James and a couple of other groovy athletes to get behind it just pro bono. Mm -hmm. And they would serve it and do the right thing with it and 
then we would stop throwing that food in the, in the garbage because it's less expensive to throw it away than it would be to incentivize it. And the best thing that we have in the American marketplace is our free market system. If I can somehow give them a penny a ton or a penny a hundred pounds or a penny or whatever to take those lentils they're going to throw away and those carrots and those whatever and the Swiss chard and the cabbage and whatever and we can figure out a way to use it by using a guy like, like Dan Barber mm -hmm. from Blue Hill here who thinks that way and knows how to make things delicious. He did that wasted food concept that was such a fascinating idea. If we could use the big four group to harness the energy that could be potential by incentivizing using wasted food, that could be something where they would be so effective and so powerful and so change their brand to the right way. That's what I would recommend. All right. And then you also, just I forgot, Des, you do, you sell your own goods, right? Do you, you have deals with Amazon, with others, or not? Do you, do you think about that? I don't, that? I mean, I'm... In I'm, an e-commerce, do you... We sell through anybody that'll sell it. You mean, you mean in terms yeah. of Italy? Yeah. Yeah, we'll do e-commerce with anybody who is, is legitimately going to help us distribute it. Do you see that shifting where it's selling? Well, I think it was an interesting move that they bought... Uh, Whole Foods. Whole Foods was a fascinating move. I can't believe I didn't ask you move. about that. What do you think about that? I think it's a great thing. I think that what they're going to... What, what Amazon's going to do with Whole Foods is use that magnificent brand that Whole Foods has built, and they're going to get to people that normally couldn't get to a Whole Foods, and they're going to ship them those products at a slightly lower price because they want to invade the marketplace and take that over in a slot. They don't have necessarily everyone's best intentions in their mind as a strategy, mm -hmm. but the immediate short-term effect is that we're going to see higher quality groceries at a lower price, better distributed. Would you like Google to buy a grocery store or something? Or I, they're not buying. I don't think they're buying. Grocery no, they're not buying. Did you? So you think Amazon? Amazon should continue buying brands. I, I, I don't know that they should continue. I think it would be interesting to see how they feel about the food business in two years. Meaning? But I mean, they, well, it, you know, maybe they're going to find that spoilage is bigger than they thought. Maybe they're going to find that it's that you know it's not books. It doesn't sit for three weeks on the count, on the back dock. Right. It's slightly forgotten. You've got to move it much more quickly, and there's a velocity to it that they haven't really seen yet before. Right. So it'll be interesting to see if they can manage yeah. that. Yeah. Did you like the meat shaped like an A? Did you see that? Did. That was pretty cool. I think so. And disturbing at the same time. Odd. Yeah. All right, question right here. Hi. Um, I'm Leticia Miranda with BuzzFeed News. Um, and I wanted to ask a clarifying question, or if you could expand on your um, thoughts on um, ITSA and uh, movements to raise the minimum wage. Um, you had said that it's not the fastest way for uh, workers to get a higher qual quality of life, so I just wanted to see if you could expand no, on that. No, no, there's no question that raising minimum wage is a faster way to get people more money very quickly. I think the counter, the result of that will be that quite quickly the prices in restaurants who hire and are supported and basically run by people with minimum wage, they will have to raise their prices. So as much as it seems like a great solution, what it's going to do is eventually the boot's going to come off and we're going to realize that wherever it happens to be that that wage increase creates a 30% increase in costs for the restaurant, they're going to eventually have to raise their cost. It's not without cost that we do that. That's all I'm saying. I'm ideologically completely for everybody in America making $100,000 a year. <laughs> or more. Okay. I don't think anyone here makes less than 100, I bet, in this room. Yeah, probably not. Um, but when, when you're talking about that, that, there's the no tipping movement, there's all kinds of payment movement, you know, there's stuff that we don't pay, and, or you pay. Is that been big? That's all the restaurateurs. Basically, the restaurateurs are looking at people. No, the, the government is changing its way of looking at the way they're going to manage the restaurant industry, whether it's by making sure who gets tipped and who doesn't get tipped. It's whether who gets minimum wage, uh, how they distribute the wages, and whether or not they can operate on that kind of a level. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the restaurateurs aren't necessarily saying we don't like this. The restaurateurs are looking at it and saying, how do we make this change into something that is still sustainable for us to operate? Mm -hmm. It's not like there's an ideological bent beyond their sustainability. It's not like they're some rich robber barons and they're, they're taking their 98% profit and carving it down to 92 and they're pissed. It's they're taking wages and they're taking costs, they're raising them into a place where I know in San Francisco, a lot of my friends are closing their restaurants because mm -hmm. they went from 10% margin to 3% margin right. or from 6% margin to 0% margin. And as that happens, the rents always go up. Yeah. And it's just a very difficult thing for restaurateurs to deal with. And it will cause some attrition and it will be lost and then someone will come along and it, eventually it will always settle. And these kind of things are mm -hmm. exactly that. They're just, they're, they're slightly tectonic, but at the end of the day, they will settle quickly and things will find some resolution. At the end of the day in America, we pay 
40% less for a restaurant meal than we do in Europe. Wake up, it's gonna happen. Right. It's gonna cost 50 bucks to go to a restaurant pretty soon in America. Mm -hmm. Because we have to internalize all the costs that we haven't had to do so far. So I do, do you want to ask one last question, if there's no more questions with the audience. What is your tech diet? What do you do? You see, you're very active, so what, what, do you, what is your actual tech diet? What do you, do you? Well, you mean like, what do I consume on a regular basis? Yeah. Well, I, I, read, uh, I read the New York Times in hard print, Mm -hmm. Because I like to support, you know, Warehouser. Okay. Um, I look at three or four forms of social media every morning. Uh, in the afternoon, I kind of check in on some things. I look at the Wall Street Journal. I look at the New York Times. I look at the Washington Post. I look at LA. I look at the Singapore Times. I look at the Hong Kong News, and I look at the Jesus. London Times. Okay. And then around 9 o'clock at night, I watch Rachel Maddow, and I feel comfortable when I go to bed. On that, Mario Vitali. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Recode Managing Editor Ed Lee and Racked Shopping Director Tiffany Yanetta. Out. It's all right. Um, I wanted to sort of remark really quickly.